So morning all of you, I'm, I'm actually a fresher in this domain. I started learning this uh, topic because I had nothing to do when the lockdown started. So my knowledge or experience is about two, three years old. Um, but um, I have got drawn into this first because of the technical challenges that were there, like interesting puzzles to solve. And uh, uh, the other thing that drew to me was a lot of disturbing reports. We, I don't, we don't have to see in the media, we just had to go on the roads to realize that almost any city, the pollution, vehicular pollution is very bad. And uh, according to reports, uh, India has 22 of 30 most polluted cities in the world. And um, so let me start with a quiz. If I just ask you to take a guess on a per capita, imagine there are close to one and a half billion people in India. And if I were to apportion all the vehicular pollution equally among all Indians per capita in a year, how many kilograms of carbon dioxide emission do you think we have? Any wild guesses? Just to give you an anchor, uh, the average person in an entire year would eat about 100 kilograms of food grain. And when I did the math, what I found was that it is 200 kilograms per capita per year, carbon dioxide, from vehicular pollution alone. And the rate at which it is growing, about 7% per annum, uh, if we extrapolate it to the year 2047, Per capita, it will grow to uh, 1,000 kilos, even after discounting it for the population growth. So, obviously, if we do nothing about it. But it turns out that it's actually very easy to solve the problem through a 100% transition to electric vehicles. Uh, it can happen almost overnight. That doesn't take much at all, and the benefits will be immediate and palpable. Uh, it just requires a very small percentage of the land to be earmarked for solar power generation. And the resulting power would, uh, if we were to compare with the replaced diesel, it would be equivalent to about seven rupees per liter of diesel. That would be the cost of the power that is so produced. So it is something that is eminently doable. And already we have demonstrated that we can uh, grow solar power uh, install solar power and harness it at scale. We just have to do it somewhat faster, as quickly as possible. But the other, uh, this alone will not, just producing the power is not uh, enough. We need to transition to vehicles that can draw upon this power and run. And in this, the area I work in, um, which is the replacement of the engine in a conventional vehicle, it's called the traction motor. It, it's a particularly tough uh, technical problem uh, because typically when a vehicle is running in the traffic, it doesn't go at a uniform speed. Uh, it would suddenly accelerate, then it will slow down, maybe it will go up a hill, sometimes it will be overloaded, all these kind of things. So what happens is when we plot the load versus the speed, it, uh, it runs under very different range of load speed combinations what is called the top speed um, plot. And a normal motor, the kind of motors that have been around for maybe more than 100 years, they are all normally designed and optimized to operate around a certain operating point, uh, but they cannot accommodate this wide swing. And not only must the traction motor accommodate this entire range of performance where the operating demands could change within seconds, it must also achieve it in a very small form factor because space is at a premium. And it has to achieve this in as little a weight as possible. If I'm having a motor that is pumping water to my overhead tank, I don't care if it's big, I'm not carrying it on my shoulders. But the vehicle is always carrying the motor, so it, the weight is also another matter leading to the payload otherwise. And uh, of course, it must not uh, create noise and vibration because it's not kept in some far away secluded uh, place. It is right in the vicinity of where the passengers are sitting. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about a traction motor, which is nicely engineered and developed, is that the entire paraphernalia of a conventional engine is reduced to just a single moving part. Um, 
So it tremendously simplifies the design and when a person driving the vehicle wants to control the engine, all that he or she is doing is sending a signal by wire to the motor and the motor responds accordingly. And so logically the question to ask is, can all the other vehicle functions also be done by having just one moving part each? By just communicating a signal through a wire. So the buzzword in the industry now is called X by wire. You can drive by wire, steer by wire, brake by wire, suspension by wire. In fact, in braking, it's even possible to not add any additional moving part. The motor itself can do the braking. Um, and there are many companies world over who have been trying to do this for 10, 20 years. This is a picture from a company called Michelin, which has been developing something called an active wheel for 20 years, where they have tried to put all things into the wheel, so that all that you have to do is link them up with a platform and you have a vehicle ready. And everything else is free form. But even after 20 years, it's not coming to the market. These are all hard technologies to work in. Uh, uh, very difficult to have good, usable products uh, that can come into the market. So still all these are under development. So in that sense, actually, it presents a great opportunity for us uh, to quickly leapfrog and provide leadership to the world. The benefits of uh, doing active R&D in all these areas uh, is that, yes, increased reliability, higher efficiency, I told you regeneration, which means when you're slowing down or braking, you can put that energy back into the battery. A lot of these things, these are all, uh, there is no catch up that we need to do. All of these are in infancy world over and we can easily beat other people. Now, if we look at actually the status of where we are in terms of the EV industry, uh, we don't have a lot of the minerals that are important. You need rare earth materials for um, magnets. You need lithium for the batteries. And our uh, ability to make different components is very weak, very poor. Um, we used to make some of those conventional weak, what are called ferrite magnets for uh, loudspeakers and all that. Even that we seem to have stopped making. We are only importing them. And we never, of course, made uh, semiconductor chips or the battery cells themselves. We can assemble the cells into batteries. Um, and uh, special grades of steel are required to go into the motor and we don't make any of that. Uh, very recently we started making some grades of electrical steel in small quantities which can go into an adjacent application called transformer but we don't make motor grade steel at all. And although India has a very large steel industry, we make all the generic structural steel but no specialty steels get made in India. Um, and um, so whatever manufacturing of electric vehicles happens is largely a matter of just buying stuff at component level, module level, putting things together. Uh, even any capital goods that may go into the manufacturing, they are also imported. So only thing that we seem to be having as a strength is the lower wage cost. And um, whether it's a large company like Ola or small, smaller companies, I was surprised to discover that practically in every district headquarter there are probably two or three EV companies, EV manufacturers. It just goes to show how simple and modular the technology actually is. You didn't have this when there were IC engines. Small uh, outfits cannot say I'll start making a bike or a car, but with electric you can. And uh, there are 6,000 EV manufacturers, uh, each of them probably selling within a 200 kilometer radius of where they are, maybe selling 100 vehicles in a year. This kind of a thing. Mostly two wheelers and some entry level three wheelers. So what we need to build on this base and take India to a leadership level is we need to have R&D led manufacturing. Earlier speakers today have talked about it in different contexts. Uh, design in India is very important, as important as make in India. <laughs> Um, so we need to, for example, it is possible to technologically address the fact that we don't have rare earths and other things through alternate topologies of magnets, uh, of uh, motors, and we can work on it. Are, we are already working on it. We need, we need more people, more teams working on this, recognizing that design-led manufacturing is going to be the way forward. And um, 
what does it take to go into this? It just takes a bunch of uh, confident young minds. And with something like about a year's training, if I can call it that, training is really a more fancy word. It's more an opportunity where you have access to knowledge, freedom to think, and a culture which says it's okay if you make some mistakes as long as you learn from it. Then within a year, I have found that teams can be very productive uh, in what is called a very cutting edge area. They can actually contribute very creatively and uh, make original contributions. And rather than taking some design from somewhere and customizing it or adapting it uh, or something like that, one can actually start ground up from the end use context and build uh, the solutions ground up. And for this, the important thing is that the team working on it, uh, they cannot work in silos. It's the intersection of many different uh, uh, domains of engineering knowledge. So we need to build um, cross-functional teams with a lot of close-knit action and free communication. Otherwise, the juice doesn't really get flowing. Uh, and uh, when we do this, it is possible to come with very targeted offerings for any market, starting with, of course, India. We can look at the particular segment or which vehicle and so on. And we can design stuff which is inexpensive when manufactured at scale. Um, this is it. I think I'm on time. Open to any questions. And yeah, lastly, I want to say that 2047 looks like a very long drawn uh, deadline, we should get there in 10 years, and we can, it's very much within our grasp. <laughs>